Thousands of years ago, the human species began to be conscious of itself and its surroundings. From that moment on, our development has been driven by the desire to go beyond the known world, to explore the limits of the mind and nature. Where do we come from? Where are we going? How does everything that surrounds us work? Curiosity is the starting point of these questions. But curiosity alone is not enough to get answers. Throughout history, human reasoning has gotten more and more sophisticated to the point of even doubting itself. This doubt has allowed us to make discoveries that have multiplied themselves in the form of applications and technology. But the doubts we subject our reasoning to needs a method. We need to experiment to compare what we think against the phenomena that we observe in nature. This dialogue with the natural world that surrounds us is not simple, but sometimes it reveals to us the mechanisms of the cosmos. Then, finally, something begins to make sense and we can exclaim, Eureka! Experiments are an essential part of the scientific description of reality. Just as a painter employs the metal language of painting using his brush, his canvas, and his colors to describe an action, a scene, the scientist employs the metal language of mathematics, a metal language of algorithms, which he sets into motion on a computer in an attempt to describe nature. The scientist dreams to describe a phenomenon, to understand a phenomenon with logic, with reasoning, with mathematics, to repeat it, and to prove that that phenomenon is repeatable. Experiments are absolutely basic. A theory is useless if it has no relation with experimental or observational reality. A theory is useless if it gives rise to false predictions. Another thing that we can do, and which is accepted, is to assume that there are certain extraordinarily improbable facts in the history of the universe, and the theories accept these facts as long as they are limited by probabilities that never contradict what is observed. Science was born from the observation of the world around us. But looking at the sky soon ceased to be a contemplative pastime and became a source of knowledge. Thanks to their observations, the ancients managed to create models that guaranteed their ability to predict what would happen over our heads. And they used that knowledge to transform the world. The pyramids of Cheops, Kefren, and Miserinos, built during the reign of the kings of the fourth dynasty, represent a clear example. The perfect orientation of the pyramids was made possible by the observation of the movement of the stars Fecta and Megres, the equivalent to part of our Big Dipper. The prolongation of the line joining these two stars pointed towards Thuban, the name given to the North Star in ancient Egypt. The precise orientation of the Egyptian pyramids continues to be a topic of interest that goes back to one of the moments in the history of civilization in which astronomy was put at the service of culture, as in this case, of monumental architecture. Thousands of years after the pharaohs assured themselves that their eternal rest would be in tune with the celestial bodies, observation has become one of the pillars of the scientific method. In 1929, the astronomer Edwin Hubble gazed at the sky through the powerful telescope on Mount Wilson. He observed that all the galaxies seemed to be moving away from each other, which suggested that at an earlier time, they would have been much closer together. Even that at one time, the whole universe could have been condensed in a single point in space. Parting from this fact drawn from observation, George Gamow elaborated a theory of the origin and evolution of the universe that included several predictions, 
among them the existence of background radiation in the form of microwaves at a very low temperature. This prediction was later corroborated, which has made his theory, known as the Big Bang, the dominant model in modern cosmology. The model of the Big Bang is a good example of how science evolves and how it evolved in an extraordinarily brilliant way during the 20th century. What today is the Big Bang model was invented because there were a series of observational facts that had to be explained. And the Big Bang model is the theory that explains the greatest number of experimental and observational facts with the minimum of hypotheses. In the process of trying to understand if that description of the universe was real, that is, if it somehow created a model of what had actually occurred, calculations were made regarding the properties that the universe ought to have, and among them emerged the prediction that there should be a sort of radiation that would permeate the entire universe and that should have certain properties of its own. This radiation would be a relic from when the universe was very primitive and very young. This cloud of points we see when we try to tune in a channel on our television sets is microwave background radiation. It is the echo of a crucial moment in the dawning of the cosmos, when the first atoms were formed and light began to circulate freely. This image shows the universe when it was barely 300,000 years old. It was taken in 1992 by the COBE satellite launched by NASA to study background radiation. By studying this radiation, we can reveal how the stars and galaxies appeared and evolved. That's why satellites have been launched to study that radiation in a tremendously precise way, in an attempt to discover the minute temperature differences that provide clues to the birth of the matter of stars. In fact, Today, observations can be carried out using ever more complex tools that are able to provide increasingly more precise data. The microwave anisotropic probe is making it possible to refine our knowledge of background radiation and its differences in temperature. The map has made it possible to determine the age of the universe with fair precision. We now know that everything began 13.7 billion years ago. It seems unlikely that we will ever be able to reproduce the Big Bang with an experiment, but we can see the remains of that explosion, the straggling shreds of time, the clues to what happened. If, for example, we want to look with increasing detail at what is happening, for example, on the surface of the sun, we have to think that there are, of course, large telescopes that operate from the Earth's surface in especially appropriate places, such as, for example, the Canary Islands. But they have systems to correct the influence of the Earth's atmosphere, what is called adaptive optics. And I believe that this is going to be one of the fields of the instrumental battle. At the same time, without a doubt, Having better and better detectors in parts of the spectrum that are still relatively unknown, with less detail than that of visible radiation, such as infrared radiation, X-rays, gamma rays, all these kinds of developments and all these windows that we have to study the sun are going to be decisive. The Hubble telescope is located 600 kilometers over our heads and is able to go back 10 billion years in time to when the universe was much younger than it is now and the Earth hadn't formed yet. It has shown us some surprising things. The last size of stars before dying, black holes, the birth of stars, sources of ultraviolet light, or the violent crash of two galaxies, for example. This body of information has allowed us to understand more about the origin and workings of the universe, in which the Earth is no more than a humble planet spinning around a rather dim star 
in a mid-sized galaxy. From space, the Earth looks terribly fragile, because as far as we know, it is the only place where the phenomenon of life has occurred, life that has never been in greater danger than it is right now. From the Envisat, the largest satellite ever launched by the European Space Agency, it is possible to take the environmental pulse of the Earth. The hole in the ozone layer is an example of the battles we will have to win in the fight for sustainable development. But our planet's diseases were predicted before the symptoms were visible. In 1973, Mario Molina and Sherwood Rowland demonstrated that certain gases, the chlorofluorocarbons, could rise to the stratosphere, where they would be decomposed by solar radiation, freeing chlorine that would attack the ozone. And in such a way that a single atom could destroy tens of thousands of ozone molecules. Their article was published in the prestigious magazine Nature, but nobody paid attention to such an outlandish hypothesis.